Reading through the Book of Concord in one year, 52 sessions or 52 weeks. This is session three or week three. We will cover Luther's large catechism uh, in the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, page 361 through page 371. Page 361 through 371. Uh, the completion of the first commandment through the third commandment and Luther's large catechism. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20, 5 and 6. Luther writes, These words relate to all the commandments, as we shall learn later, but they are joined to this chief commandment because it is the most important that people get their thinking straight first. For where the head is right, the whole life must be right, and vice versa. Learn, therefore, from these words how angry God is with those who trust in anything but Him. And again, Learn how good and gracious he is to those who trust and believe in him alone with their whole heart. Deuteronomy 6, 5. His anger does not stop until the fourth generations of those who hate him. He says this so you will not live in such security and commit yourself to chance like people with brute hearts who think that it makes no great difference how they live. On the other hand, his blessing and goodness reach many thousands. He is a God who will not overlook that people turn from him. He will not stop being angry until the fourth generation, even until they are utterly exterminated. Therefore, he is to be feared and not to be despised. He has also made this known in all history, as the scriptures abundantly show and daily experience still, daily experience still teaches. For from the beginning he has utterly uprooted all idolatry. Because of idolatry he has uprooted both heathen people and Jewish people. To this day he overthrows all false worship, so that all who remain therein must finally perish. Proud, powerful, and rich men of the world, who surpass even the Persians in wealth, are still to be found. They boast defiantly of their mammon. They utterly disregard whether God is angry at them or smiles on them. They dare to withstand his wrath, yet they shall not succeed. Before they are aware of it, they shall be wrecked with all in which they trusted. All others have perished like this who have thought themselves more secure or powerful. Such hard hearts, such hard heads, imagine that God overlooks and allows them to rest in security or that he is entirely ignorant or cares nothing about such matters. Therefore God must deal a smashing blow and punish them, so that he cannot forget their sin unto their children's children. In that way everyone may take note and see that this is no joke to him. These are the people he means when he says, Those who hate me. Exodus 25. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. I.e., those who persist in their defiance and pride. Whatever is preached or said to them, they will not listen. When they are rebuked, in order that they may learn to know themselves and make amends before the punishment begins, they become mad and foolish. They rightly deserve wrath, as we see daily in bishops and princes now. But as terrible as these threatenings are, so much more powerful is the consolation and the promise. For those who cling to God alone should be sure that he will show them mercy. In other words, he will show them pure goodness and blessing, not only for themselves, but also to their children and their children's children, even to the thousandth generation and beyond that. This ought certainty to move and impel us to risk our hearts and all confidence with God, if we wish all temporal and eternal good. For the Supreme Majesty makes such outstanding offers and presents such heartfelt encouragements and such rich promises Therefore, let everyone seriously take this passage to heart, lest it be regarded as though a man had spoken it. For you it is a question of eternal blessing, happiness, and salvation, or of eternal wrath, misery, and woe. What more would you have or desire than God so kindly promising to be yours with every blessing and to protect and help you in all need? 
but unfortunately, here is the failure. The world believes none of this, nor regards it as God's word, for the world sees that those who trust in God and not in mammon suffer and care, care, suffer care and want, and that the devil opposes and resists them. They don't have money or favor or honor, and besides, can scarcely support life. On the other hand, those who serve mammon have power, favor, honor, possessions, and every comfort in the eyes of the world. For this reason, these words must be understood to speak against the appearance of such things. And we must consider that they do not lie or deceive, but must come true. Reflect for yourself or investigate and tell me. Those who have used all their care and diligence to gather great possessions and wealth, what have they finally gained? You will find that they have wasted their toil and labor, or even though they have amassed great treasures, they have been dispersed and scattered. So they themselves have never found happiness in their wealth, and afterward it never reached the third generation. You will find plenty of examples in all histories, also in the memory of age and experienced people. Just watch and ponder them. Saul was a great king, chosen by God, and a godly man. But when he, but when he was established on his throne, he let his heart wander from God and put his trust in his crown and power. Then he had to perish with all he had, so that not even his children remained. David, on the other hand, was a poor, despised man, hunted down and chased, so that he did not feel his life was secure anywhere. Yet he had to survive in spite of Saul and become king. For these words of the promise had to abide and come true, since God cannot lie or deceive. Just let not the devil and the world deceive you with their show, which indeed remains for a time, but finally is nothing. Let us then learn well the first commandment, that we may see how God will tolerate no overconfidence nor any trust in any other object. We will see how he requires nothing greater from us than confidence from the heart for everything good. Then we may live right and straightforward and use all the blessings that God gives, just as a shoemaker uses his needle and thread for work and then lays them aside. Or we may behave like a traveler using an end, food, and bed only to meet his present need. Each person may do this in his calling, according to God's order, and without allowing any of these things to be his Lord or idol. This is enough about the first commandment, which we had, which we have had to explain at length, since it is of chief importance. For as said earlier, where the heart is rightly set toward God, and this commandment is observed, all the other commandments follow. The second commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The first commandment has instructed the heart and taught the faith. This commandment now leads us forward and directs the mouth and tongue to God. For the first thing that springs from the heart and shows themselves are words. Matthew 12:34. I have taught above how to answer the question, what does it mean to have a God? Now you must simply learn to understand the meaning of this commandment and all the commandments and to apply it to yourself. If someone now asks, how do you understand the second commandment? Or, what is meant by taking God's name in vain or misusing God's name? Answer briefly in this way. It means misusing God's name when we call upon the Lord God, no matter how in order to deceive or do wrong of any kind. Therefore, this commandment makes this point. God's name must not be appealed to falsely or taken upon the lips while the heart knows well enough, or should know, that the truth of the matter is different. This is what happens with people who take oaths in court where one side lies against the other. For God's name cannot be misused worse than for support of falsehood and deceit. Let this remain the exact German and simplest meaning of this commandment. From this everyone can easily see when and in how many ways God's name is misused, although it is impossible to list all its misuses, but to explain this in a few words, all misuse of the divine name 
name happens first in worldly business and in matters that concern money, possessions, and honor. This applies publicly in court, in the market, or wherever else people make false oaths in God's name or pledge their souls in any matter. This is especially common in marriage affairs, where two go and secretly get engaged to one another and afterward break their engagement. But the greatest abuse occurs in spiritual matters. These have to do with the conscience, when false preachers rise up and offer their lying vanities as God's word. Jonah 2, eight. Look, all this is d- dressing up oneself with God's name or making a pretty show or claiming to be right. This is true whether it happens in common worldly business or in higher refined matters of faith and doctrine. Blasphemers also belong with the liars. I mean, not just the most ordinary blasphemers, well known to everyone, who disgrace God's name without fear. These are not for us to discipline, but for the hangman. I also mean those who publicly disagree, disgrace the truth and God's word, and hand it over to the devil. There is now no need to speak about this further. Here, then, let us learn and take to heart the great importance of this commandment. Then, with all diligence, we may guard against and dread every misuse of the holy name as the greatest sin that can be committed outwardly. For to lie and to deceive is in itself a great sin. But such a sin gets even worse when we try to justify our lie and seek to convert, confirm it by calling on God's name and using his name as a cloak for shame. 1 Peter 2.16 So that from a single lie a double lie results. No, many lies. For this reason, too, God has added a solemn threat to his commandment. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Exodus 27 This means that this sin shall not be pardoned for anyone who go, who, or go unpunished. For just as he will not fail to avenge if anyone returns his heart from him, so he will also not let his name be used to dress up a lie. Now, unfortunately, this sin is a common plague in all the world. There are so few people who do not use God's name for, the, for purposes of lying in all wickedness in contrast to those who trust in God alone with all their heart. By nature... We all have within us this beautiful virtue that wh- whoever has committed a wrong would like to cover up and adorn his disgrace so that no one may see it or know it. No one is so bold as to boast to all the world of the wickedness he has done. All wish to act by stealth and without anyone bear- being aware of what they do. So if anyone is caught sinning, God's name is dragged into the affair and must make the wickedness look like godliness and the shame like honor. This is the common way of the world, which has covered all lands like a great flood. So we get what we seek and deserve as our reward. Epidemics, wars, famines, raging fires, floods, wayward wives and children, servants, and all sorts of filth. Where else should so such misery come from? Is it still a great mercy that the earth bears and supports us? Numbers chapter 18, verses 28 through 50. Therefore, above all things, our young people should have the second commandment earnestly pressed upon them. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. They should be trained to hold this and the first commandment in high regard, and whenever they sin, we must at once be after them with the rod. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. We must hold the commandment before them and constantly teach it so that we bring them up not only with punishment but also in reverence and fear of God. Ephesians 6, verse 4. Now you understand what it means to take God's name in vain. In sum, it means, A, to use his name simply for purposes of falsehood, B, to assert in God's name something that is not true, or C, to curse, swear, use spells, and in short, to practice whatever wickedness one may. Besides this, you must also know how to use God's name rightly. 
For when he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, he wants us to understand at the same time that his name is to be used properly. For his name has been revealed and given to us so that it may be of constant use and profit. So it is natural to conclude that since this commandment forbids using the holy name for falsehood or wickedness, we are, on the other hand, commanded to use his name for truth and for all good, like when someone takes an oath truthfully when it is needed and is demanded. Numbers chapter 30 verse 2. This commandment also applies to right teaching and to calling on his name in trouble or praising and thanking him in prosperity and so on. All of this is summed up and commanded in Psalm 50 verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. For all this is bringing God's name into the service of truth and using it in a blessed way. In this way, his name is hallowed as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, verse 9. Now you have the sum of the entire commandment explained. With this understanding, the question that has troubled many teachers has been easily solved. Why is swearing prohibited in the gospel? And yet Christ, St. Paul, and other saints often swore. Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37. Matthew 26, verse 29. Acts 21, verses 20 through 26. The explanation is briefly this. We are not to swear in support of evil, that is, to support falsehood, or to swear when there is no need or use. But we should swear for the support of good and the advantage of our neighbor. For such swearing is truly a good work, by which God is praised, truth and right are established, falsehood is refuted, peace is made among men, obedience is rendered, and quarrels are settled. For in this way God himself intervenes and separates right and wrong, good and evil. If one party swears falsely, he lives under this judgment. He shall not escape punishment. Even if this judgment is delayed a long time, he shall not succeed. So everything he may gain from his falsehood will slip out of his hands, and he will never enjoy it. I have seen this in the case of many who perjured themselves in their wedding vows. They have never had a happy hour or a healthy day, and so perish miserably in body soul, and possession. Therefore I advise and exhort as before that with warning and threatening, restraints and punishment, the children should be trained early to shun falsehood. They should especially avoid the use of God's name to support falsehood. For where children are allowed to do as they please, no good will result. This is clear even now. The world is worse than it has ever been. And there is no government, no obedience, no loyalty, no faith, but only daring, unbridled people. No teaching or reproof helps them. All this is God's wrath and punishment for such lewd contempt of this commandment. On the other hand, children should be constantly urged and moved to honor God's name and to have it always upon their lips for everything that may happen to them or come to their notice. Psalm 8, verse 2. Psalm 34, verse 1. Matthew 21, verse 16, and Hebrews 13, verse 15. For that is the true honor of his name, to look to it and call upon it for all consolation. Psalm 62, verse 2, 66, verse 2, and Psalm 105, verse 1. Then, as we have heard in the first commandment, the heart by faith gives God the honor due him first. Afterward, the lips give him honor by confession. This is also a blessed and useful habit and very effective against the devil. He is ever around us and lies in wait to bring us into sin and shame, disaster and trouble. 2 Timothy 2 verse 26. But he hates to fear, but he hates to hear God's name and cannot remain long where it is spoken and called upon from the heart. Indeed, many terrible and shocking disasters would fall upon us if God did not preserve us by our by our calling upon his name. I have tried it myself. I learned by experience that often sudden great suffering was immediately adverted and removed by calling on God. To confuse the devil, I say we should always have this holy name in our mouth so that the devil may not be able to injure us as he wishes. It is also useful that we form the habit of daily commending ourselves to God. Psalm 31 verse 5. 
with soul and body, wife, children, servants, and all that we have, against every need that may arise. So also the blessing and thanksgiving at meals, Mark 8, verse 6. And other prayers, morning and evening, have begun and remain, remained in use, Exodus 29, verses 38-43. Likewise, children should continue to cross themselves when anything monstrous or terrible is seen or heard. They can shout, Lord God, protect us. Help us, dear Lord Jesus, and such. Also, if anyone meets with unexpected good fortune, however trivial, he says, God be praised and thanks, or God has bestowed this upon me, and so on. Just as the children used to learn to fast and pray to St. Nicholas and other saints before, this would be more pleasing and acceptable to God than all the monasticism and acts of holiness. Look, we could train our youth this way, Proverbs 22, verse 6, in a childlike way and playfully in the fear and honor of God. Then the first and second commandments might be well kept and in constant practice. Then some good might take root, spring up and bear fruit. People would grow up whom an entire land might relish and enjoy. In addition, this would be the true way to bring up children to, and to bring them up well as long as they could be trained with kindness and delight. For children who must be forced with rods and blows will not develop into a good generation. At best, they will remain godly under such treatment only as, only as long as the rod is upon their backs. Proverbs 10, verse 13. But teaching the commandments in a childlike and playful way spreads its roots in the heart so that children fear God more than rods and clubs. This I say with such simplicity for the sake of the young, that it may penetrate their minds. For we are preaching to children, so we must also talk like them. In this way we would prevent the abuse of the divine name and teach the right use. This should happen not only in words, but also in practice and life. Then we may know God is well pleased with this and will and will as richly reward good use of his name as he will terribly punish the abuse. The third commandment. You shall sanctify the holy day. The word holiday is used for the Hebrew word Sabbath, which properly means to rest, that is, to cease from labor. Therefore, we usually say to stop working or sanctify the Sabbath. Now in the Old Testament, God set apart the seventh day and appointed it for rest, Genesis 2, verse 3. He commanded that it should be regarded as a holy day, a holy, holy above all other days. This commandment was given only to the Jewish people for this outward obedience, that they should stop toilsome work and rest. In that way, both man and beast might recover and not be weakened by endless labors. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Later, the Jewish people restricted the Sabbath too closely and greatly abused it. They defamed Christ and could not endure in him the same works that they themselves would do on that day, as we read in the Gospel of Matthew 12, verse 11. They acted as though the commandment were fulfilled by doing no manual work whatsoever. This, however, was not the meaning. But, as we shall hear, they were supposed to sanctify the holy, holy day or day of rest. This commandment, therefore, in its literal sense, does not apply to us Christians. It is entirely an outward matter, like other ordinances in the Old Testament. The ordinances were attached to particular customs, persons, times, and places, but now they have made matters of free they have been made matters of freedom through Christ. Colossians chapter two, verses sixteen and seventeen. The simple minded need to grasp a Christian meaning about what God requires in this commandment. Note that we don't keep holy days for the sake of intelligence and learned Christians. They have no need of holy days. We keep them first of all for bodily causes and necessity, which nature teaches and requires. We keep them for the common people, manservants and maidservants, who have been attending to their work and trade the whole week. In this way they may withdraw in order to rest for a day and be refreshed. Second, and most especially, on this day of rest, 
since we can get no other chance. We have the freedom and time to attend divine service. We come together to hear and use God's word and then to praise God, to sing and to pray. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. However, this keeping of the Sabbath, I point out, is not restricted to a certain time as with the Jewish people. It does not have to be just on this or that day, for in itself no one day is better than another. Romans chapter 14 verses 5 and 6. Instead, this should be done daily. However, since the masses of people cannot attend every day, there must be at least one day in the week set apart. From ancient times, Sunday, the Lord's Day, has been appointed for this purpose. So we also should continue to do the same, in order that everything may be done in an orderly, orderly way. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. And no one may create disorder by starting unnecessary practices. This is the simple meaning of the commandment. People must have holidays. Therefore, such observances should be devoted to hearing God's word so that the special function of this day of rest should be the ministry of the word for the young and the mass of poor people. Nehemiah 8, verses 2 through 3 and 8. Yet the resting should not be strictly understood to forbid any work that comes up which cannot be avoided. So when someone asks you what is meant by the commandment you shall sanctify the holy day, answer like this. To sanctify the holy day is the same as to keep it holy. But what is meant by keeping it holy? Nothing else than to be occupied with holy words, works, and life. For the day needs no sanctification for itself. It has been created holy in itself. But God desires the day to be holy to you. Therefore, it becomes holy or unholy because of you, whether you are occupied on that day with things that are holy or unholy. How, then, does such sanctification take place? Not like this, sitting behind the stove and doing no rough work, or adorning ourselves with a wreath and putting on our best clothes. But as I said above, we occupy ourselves with God's word and exercise ourselves in the word. Indeed, we Christians ought always to keep such a holy day and be occupied with nothing but holy things. This means we should daily be engaged with God's word and carry it in our hearts and upon our lips. Psalm 119 verses 11 through 13. But as I said above, since we do not always have free time, we must devote several hours a week for the sake of the young, or at least a day for the sake of the entire multitude, to being concerned about this alone. We must especially teach the use of the Ten Commandments, the Creed and the Lord's Prayer, and so direct our whole life and being according to God's Word. At whatever time, then, this is being observed and practiced, there is a true holy day, and that holy day is being kept. Other things shall not be called a Christian a Christian's holy day. For indeed, non-Christians can also stop working and be idle, just as the entire swarm of our church workers do. They stand daily in the churches, singing and ringing bells, but they do not keep a holy day in true holiness because they do not preach or use God's word, but teach and live contrary to it. God's word is the true holy thing above all holy things. Yes, it is the only one we Christians know and have. Though we had the bones of all the saints or all holy and consecrated garments upon a heap, still that would not help us all at all. All that stuff is a dead thing that can sanctify no one. But God's word is the treasure that sanctifies everything. First Timothy 4 verse 5 by the word, even all the saints themselves were sanctified. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. Whenever God's word is taught, preached, heard, read, or meditated upon, then the person, day, and work are sanctified. This is not because of the outward work, but because of the word, which makes saints of us all. Therefore, I constantly say, that all our life and work must be guided by God's word if it is to be God-pleasing or holy. Where this is done, this commandment is in force and being fulfilled. 
On the contrary, any observance or work that is practiced without God's word is unholy before God. This is true no matter how brilliantly a work may shine, even though it is covered with relics, such as the victorious fictitious spiritual orders, which know nothing about God's word and seek holiness only in their own works. Note, therefore, that the force and power of this commandment lies not in the resting, but in the sanctifying, so that a special holy exercise belongs to this day. For other works and occupations are not properly called holy exercises unless the person is holy first. But here a work is to be done by which a person is himself made holy. This is done, as we have heard, only through God's word. For this reason, particular places, times, persons, and the entire outward order of worship have been created and appointed so that there may be order in public practice. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. So much depends upon God's word. Without it, no holy day can be sanctified. Therefore, we must know that God insists upon a strict observance of this commandment and will punish all who despise his word and are not willing to hear and learn it, especially at the time appointed for the purpose. It is not only the people who greatly misuse and desecrate the holy day who sin against this commandment, those who neglect to hear God's word because of their greed or frivolity or lie in taverns and are dead drunk like swine, but even that other crowd, but even that other crowd sins. They listen to God's word like it was any other trifle and only come to preaching because of custom. They go away again, and at the end of the year, they know as little of God's word as they as at the beginning. Up to this point, the opinion prevailed that you had properly hallowed Sunday when you heard a mass or the gospel read. But no one cared for God's word, and no one taught it. Now that we have God's word, we fail to correct the abuse. We allow ourselves to be preached to and admonished, but we do not listen seriously and carefully. No. Therefore, that you must be concerned not only about hearing, but also about learning and retaining God's word in memory. Do not think that this is optional for you or of no great importance. Think that it is God's commandment who will require an account from you, Romans 14, verse 12, about how you have heard, learned, and honored his word. Likewise, those fussy spirits are to be rebuked who, after They had heard a sermon or two find hearing more sermons to be tedious and dull. They think that they know all that well enough and need no more instruction, for that is exactly the sin that was previously counted among mortal sins and is called apathy or satisfaction. This is a malignant, dangerous plague with which the devil bewitches and deceives the hearts of many so that he may surprise us and secretly take God's word from us. Matthew 13, verse 19. Let me tell you this. Even though you know God's word perfectly and are already a master in all things, you are daily in the devil's kingdom. Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. He ceases neither day nor night to sneak up on you and to kindle in your heart unbelief and wicked thoughts against these three commandments and all the commandments. Therefore, you must always have God's word in your heart upon your lips and in your ears. But where the heart is idle and the word does not make a sound, the devil breaks in and has done the damage before we are aware. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. On the other hand, the word is so effective that whenever it is seriously contemplated, heard and used, it is, bo- it is bound never to be without fruit. Isaiah 55, verse 11, and Mark 4, verse 20. It always awakens new understanding, pleasure, and devoutness, and produces a pure heart and pure thoughts. Philippians 4, verse 8. For these words are not lazy or dead, but are creative, living words. Hebrews 4, verse 12. And even though no other interest or necessity moves us, this truth ought to urge everyone to the word because thereby the devil is put to flight and driven away, 
James 4, verse 7. Besides, this commandment is fulfilled, and this exercise in the word is more pleasing to God than any work of hypocrisy, however brilliant. This is the end of session three, week three of reading through the Lutheran Confessions, the Book of Concord in one year. We are reading through the reader's edition of the Book of Concord. Today we read through um, Luther's large catechism, the end of the first commandment, beginning on page 361, through the end of the third commandment on page 371.